Thank you all for being here. And welcome to Engage at the Bush Center presented by Highland Capital Management. Speaking of our awesome presenting sponsor, our next Engage event is the annual Highland Capital Lecture. It'll be on June 12th, Dana Perino from Fox News Channel, one of our favorites, will host what is sure to be a fascinating and timely conversation with Ian Bremmer and Neil Ferguson on today's Global Flashpoints. Tickets are available, but they won't last long, so please visit bushcenter.org soon to reserve your seats. Here at the Bush Center, of course, we have a wonderful relationship uh, with our partners at SMU, and it's so nice to have SMU President Dr. Gerald Turner and his wife Gail here with us tonight. We're grateful to all of our board members who are in attendance. Knowing our panelists uh, who will be out here in a minute, uh, tonight is gonna be one of those engaged programs that is both informative and highly entertaining. These guys know how to tell a story. Uh, and it's a rare treat to have the curtain pulled back from those who are on the front lines of protecting the president and the uh, first family. We're honored to be joined tonight by three former Secret Service agents whose combined years of service uh, almost approach 82 years. Privileged to have Larry Boondorf with us, 22-year veteran of the Secret Service. Larry was honored with the U.S. Secret Service Valor Award for his role in stopping an assassination attempt on President Gerald Ford in September of 1975 in Sacramento. Later, Larry served 25 years as the security chief with the United States Olympic Committee. Joe Clancy is with us tonight. Joe served on the protective details of four presidents, including President Bush, or Trailblazer, as he would have called him by his Secret Service code name. Mrs. Bush was Tempo, President Bush was Trailblazer. Joe's nearly 30-year career with the service culminated in 2015 when President Obama named Joe the 24th Director of the U.S. Secret Service, so he was in charge. Today, Joe is the Chief Security Officer at Comcast Corporation. Nick Trotta is with us tonight. Nick served 30 years in the Secret Service, helped protect five presidents, including President Bush, worked on large-scale events such as World Leader Summits, did a lot of post-9-11 travel with President Bush, including secret trips to Iraq and Afghanistan that you'll hear about tonight. And you, if Nick looks familiar, you may have seen him in a documentary or two talking about being on the field at Yankee Stadium as President Bush threw out the first pitch before Game 3 of the 2001 World Series. What a moment. Also pleased tonight to have with us as moderator Spencer Geisinger, the former Deputy Assistant to the President for operations in advance at the White House under President Bush. In that role, Spence oversaw the integration of dozens of military, security, and operational agencies, uh, all involved in presidential travel, including, of course, the U.S. Secret Service. Today, Spence serves as the Global Director of Business Development for Show Call Inc., an international premier event production company. We had planned to have with us tonight former Secret Service agent Kathleen Flatley, uh, but due to a medical issue, Kathleen is unable to be here. All of us uh, here at the Bush Center and on the stage tonight wish her a speedy recovery. Uh, we're so grateful to Joe, Nick, and Larry for making the time as our former agent experts to be here with us tonight. So let's welcome Spence and our panelists onto the stage. Well, thank you all. We have a fantastic program tonight and, and some really interesting uh, information on the Secret Service and how it runs and a lot of backstories that, uh, that you'll find fa fascinating. So let's get started. Joe, um, uh, Director Clancy, I should say, um, as, a former, yeah, as a former director of the Secret Service, can you set the scene uh, with sort of the history of the Secret Service? Because it wasn't always about protection. That's correct, Spence. And um, first, I have to just say, as we're sitting here, it's a little bit unusual for agents to be sitting on stage. <laughs> Typically, we're stage left or stage right. We're pretty good talking into our sleeves, but talking to these mics are a little bit of a challenge. But, uh, and I just also want to give you a little warning that because of our training, any sudden movements might create. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I, we already noticed a couple of people didn't applaud when we walked in, so. <laughs> we got, uh, uh, but the. the uh, the uh, history of the Secret Service, it's a tremendous history, uh, over 150 years. It started uh, April 14th of 1865, Civil War, there was a lot of counterfeit currency, and the Treasury Secretary, Hugh McCullough, uh, went into Abraham Lincoln in the morning of April 14th, 
1865 and said, we've got this rampant counterfeit currency and we've got to do something about it. And Abraham Lincoln gave him the green light to go ahead to start a new agency, uh, which would be the Secret Service. And uh, he had his orders. And that night, President Lincoln went to Ford's Theater to take in a play, Our American Cousin. And we all know what happened at Ford's Theater. Uh, and then from there, uh, we continue to uh, do investigations, as, as we say throughout our history. We've gone from the paper investigations, the counterfeit currency, which we still, of course, investigate, to the plastic, the credit card investigations, which we still do, of course, and into the digital cyber world, which uh, we are uh, one of the best in the world at, uh, at that as well. But most people think of the Secret Service when you think of uh, but you think of the, uh, the protection assignment, the, the protection mission, when you think of the Secret Service. And in 1901, uh, after President McKinley's assassination, that's when we started protecting presidents. Um, and a couple years later, we got funding from Congress to do that. And, and then it just continued to progress uh, with taking on uh, candidates after Robert Kennedy's assassination. Uh, we started taking on heads of state uh, to, uh, to uh, children and wives, spouses of um, protectees. So, um, and we'll get into some of that as we go through the program. Can you talk a little bit about Beltsville, about the training uh, academy out in Beltsville, Maryland, and then, uh, and then uh, the total number of employee agents? Well, for example, this campaign coming, the presidential campaign coming up, we have 24 uh, candidates. Right. <laughs> how, how much manpower is that going to require? Yeah, it's, it's a considerable challenge. Every campaign season is a challenge for the Secret Service, but uh, I think our history proves that we've done a very good job at handling all that, but it's a, it's a tremendous um, challenge for our men and women in the Secret Service, and, and to their credit, uh, they just do a marvelous job in my view. And when you look at the, the history of the country, most of those world events, uh, the Secret Service was behind the scenes allowing those events to take place. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with our training. You know, we've got a terrific training facility out in Beltsville, Maryland, and you'll see some examples tonight where that training really paid off uh, in, uh, in world events. Um, I think we have a picture uh, that happened of, a, of an event that happened at the White House. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Normally you see Secret Service agents, you see them in nice suits, they have their earpiece in, but you never see their weapons. Here is a photo of, uh, of a long gun that's out, and can you tell us a little bit about the, what happened here? Sure, so I remember uh, President Bush had uh, just coming back from a visit uh, out of town and we came back to uh, the White House and typically once you get inside the gates of the White House, there's a little sense of relief that you've, you've accomplished your mission and there's a little bit of a uh, deep breath. But just as we're pulling up to the Oval Office area where the President gets out, you've seen it many times in the press, where he'll walk up the colonnade to the, uh, the Oval Office, we got over the air, over the um, radio, that there was a fence jumper. And the fence jumper was over on the east part of the complex, over by the Treasury Building. So I, I was sitting in the right front seat of the limousine, and I had to turn back to President Bush and say, Mr. President, uh, we have a fence jumper, and we're going to have to stand, uh, sit uh, here in the vehicle for a few minutes till we get this issue resolved. And he said, what? a fence jumper? Where? Where's the fence jumper? And he started looking behind him and <laughs> looking through. and. Uh, I was actually kind of glad for that response, you know, and, um, but then after, you know, a few seconds goes on and he, he can't see the fence jumper and I'm not hearing that it's all clear yet. And um, then the president did start to ask, hey, Joe, I've got to get to work. I've got to get in to the Oval Office here. And, uh, and it took about three minutes, but all that time I knew the uniformed officers and, and the agents, they were going to get this individual, uh, and I was confident that we'll just stay in an armored vehicle because you don't know when someone jumps the fence, are they armed, what do they have? So stay in a safe area. Uh, could we have evacuated the South Grounds? Yes, but again, I had confidence that we were going to get him, and we did in a matter of seconds, and, and then I opened the door and let President Bush out. And It might be hard for you to see this, but I know uh, from the event uh, he's smirking because he knew I was sweating through my suit because we were holding him uh, in the car. For those of you who know President Bush, he likes to run on time and he doesn't like to wait very often. So, um, hey, Larry, in 1975, you saved President Ford's life. Tell us that story. Um, I think we have a video we're going to show you of the uh, attempted assassination attempt, and then you can talk us through that that day. Okay. After it was mid-morning in Sacramento when President Ford left a hotel to walk over to the state capitol for a meeting with Governor Edmund Brown, Jr. in a speech to the state legislature. 
This was a political trip, part of the president's campaign to lock up the Republican nomination. So he was shaking hands as he went along, working the crowd, as politicians say. And it was a friendly crowd. Accompanied by aides and Secret Service agents, the president reached for every hand in sight. Suddenly, a young woman holding a gun appeared at the president's side. A Secret Service agent grabbed the gun and wrestled the young woman to the ground as other agents formed a tight protective shield around the president and moved him swiftly to the Capitol. Well, and there um, you are apprehending the would-be assassin. Well, the first thing, I probably should have had a haircut. It's back in the 70s. <laughs> At least that's what my mother said when she heard about it. But uh, <clears throat> I was uh, working the shift, the uh, morning shift, and the president was scheduled to speak at the Capitol. Uh, he walks out of the hotel. The motorcade is there as scheduled. Um, a large crowd across the street waiting to see him. So he walks out on a nice sunny day in California. He goes, I think I'll walk because it's just across the park and the Capitol building was right there. So that immediately causes a scramble with the agents and the police and trying to move the crowd in the right direction to get them so there's a pathway and to move the crowd across on one side of the sidewalk so as he walked along he could, he could shake hands. Um, my position at the time was right at his left shoulder. So as he's walking along shaking hands, I'm kind of concentrating on his hands, kind of in a downward motion, because he don't want to have anybody grab too long, take his watch, whatever. So I'm kind of looking down. Out in the crowd is a member of the Charlie Manson family, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, who uh, happened to be carrying a 45 strapped to her ankle. She was back a couple people in the crowd, and so as, I were sh as he's shaking hands, suddenly I see this hand come up with something in it, and I wasn't, at that time, didn't, didn't know it was a weapon. But I stepped in front of the president to stop the hand from coming up because I didn't want him to get hit with whatever it was. The minute I hit it, I knew it was a gun. So I yelled out, gun. Uh, all my very best friends that are with the president, they leave with the president. <laughs> Trained well. Trained well. <laughs> Part of our training program. You're on your own, buddy. <laughs> so I'm, she's screaming in the crowd, is screaming, and if I got a hold of her hand, and I got the gun, and I got the gun here pushing. Uh, another thing, Mr. Director, I didn't have my vest on. So I'm thinking that I don't know if there's more to this than it's going to happen, but I know I'm not letting go of her. I'm pushing her back through the crowd. The crowd's screaming. They see a guy in a suit. He's got a gun. He's got this girl. She's screaming. I keep pushing her away. And as I said, by then, the president's gone with the agents. I drop her down to the ground. Uh, some of the agents and police from the back of the crowd came forward. Uh, I noticed one of the agents from the shift, and I hand him the gun and proceed to cuff her, which is happening now, as you see. Um, and uh, once she was cuffed, I turned her over to the agent that was there from our intelligence division and the police. And I went back and uh, rejoined the shift. And it was pretty fast and curious. And a uh, matter of seconds, then you have a chance to sit back and, and think about um, how fast it went down. I clearly can't tell you. What did she say when you, did she make any comment? Well, supposedly she was saying it didn't go off. Well, when I hit the 45, I, she very well could have been pulling back the slide because I did grab it and it cut my hand. And I, I, for months, I kept jabbing the wound to make sure it would stay open so I could go, you see this? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it healed way too fast. So uh, it was just a little cut. But anyhow, I think she might have been pulling back. And I, when I hit it, I think I stopped the slide. She didn't have a round chambered. If she had a round chambered, it would have gone through me and the president, because as I say, I didn't have a vest on. Um, interesting thing, when we got back to Air Force One and I got pulled off to, to remain in Sacramento to be interviewed by the FBI, um, who take jurisdiction once we have an uh, attempt like that, um, and Mrs. Ford was there waiting for her. She had gone in another direction. And so when he boarded the plane, he said, 
She turned to him and said, well, how was your day, Mr. President? <laughs> <laughs> Not so good. Yeah. Well, I know the, the country is better for, for your duty that day and taking care of our president. Uh, September 11th, 2001 is a day that changed our country forever. Can you, Nick and Joe, walk us through that day, talk to us about sort of the fog of that day and, and trying to determine who was trying to decapitate our leadership of our country and, and, and sort of how you dealt with it throughout the day. Sure, it's one of those moments in history that you know everyone can pretty much uh, uh, identify and recall where you were that day. For some reason, I had come in early uh, that morning. The president, I didn't accompany him. I waited for uh, the president to return. So for whatever reason, I went to the White House early that morning. I was actually working out uh, and had ESPN on and watching uh, whatever sports uh, highlights, and then I saw the first plane, just like everyone else. Um, it was that second one when we realized uh, that we were under attack. Mrs. Bush uh, was at the U.S. Capitol at the time. So there was a, um, uh, it took some time to uh, see what was happening. Uh, we wanted to get her away from the Capitol. We had known that uh, there were three planes down. The Pentagon had just, um, the, the plane had just hit the Pentagon. And as I was, I decided to uh, go and connect with Mrs. Bush as we relocated her from the Capitol. And at that time, as we mentioned in, earlier in the, uh, uh, in the green room, there were about six planes that were still unidentified uh, at that time uh, after the, um, uh, the plane hitting the Pentagon. And it, it was a, uh, a challenging day because the United States hadn't been attacked you know, since uh, you know, Pearl Harbor and you look at the Oklahoma bombing. But in this case here, we had the president in Florida uh, who wanted to come back. You had the first lady who wanted to be teamed up with her husband. So uh, it, communication, uh, we restricted communication because of the, the nature of, of what was happening. And then the president was relocated to Louisiana, as, as everyone uh, got to see. And it took some time. The president wanted to come back. We weren't sure uh, what was happening yet. Uh, the airspace was controlled. And then it wasn't until later on in the evening that the decision was made by the president that uh, he was adamant that he was going to address the nation from the White House. Uh, and then it, it was at that point that we linked up the president uh, and the first lady. Joe, what's your recollection of that day? I actually was in Japan. I was with the uh, Secretary uh, of Treasury, O'Neill, and uh, we had just arrived from China to Japan, and that was 9 o'clock in the evening. And I said, good night, Mr. Secretary, went to my room, turned on the TV, and, and just as uh, Nick described, saw the aircraft crashing uh, into uh, the World Trade Center. Went down to uh, Secretary O'Neill and said, um, and I don't think he had seen it just yet, uh, but uh, then we um, immediately tried to get an aircraft back home to the States. But as we all know, all the aircraft were grounded. So it took about almost 24 hours to get a military flight to fly back to, uh, back to Washington, D.C. Tell us a little bit about post 9-11 um, with respect to the development of the Department of Homeland Security. And sort of that day sort of revealed a lot of things about how we treated security and how, we, how our government ran with respect to this kind of an attack and, and, and sort of the the deficiencies that were uncovered and, and sort of how the Department of Homeland Security came about. Sure. You know, again, it had developed after, you know, 9-11. And, you know, at the time, the Secret Service was under the Department of U.S. Treasury. Uh, you had other entities. You had uh, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms under Treasury. You had other departments under, under Justice. So law enforcement and the intelligence community were, you know, uh, in different agencies. U.S. Coast Guard was uh, under transportation. And it wasn't until the DHS that put it all under one roof and where you had all of the law enforcement outside of those in the Department of Justice. Uh, so you, you had this, uh, and it took some time. There was growing pains, uh, you know, with it just like, um, you know, anything else. But um, it, 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 um, it was one of those moments in history uh, when you see that the uh, department was created. Everyone was under one roof. We were able to uh, communicate. We were able to share um, a bit, uh, let's say, a bit better than than previous. Uh, and then it was getting. It was as you had mentioned earlier. It was 
then how does the country move forward right. uh, after such a tragic event like that, uh, let alone the new creation of departments and other things that the Department of Defense were doing and other uh, men and women across the whole United States uh, that were trying to strengthen and make the, safe, uh, the, the homeland safe. But it was then the president or first lady how to move and get the folks moving. Because I remember the president saying, if he st just stayed in the White House, folks in New York and DC may not go out. The other parts of the country were affected, but those in New York and DC, you know, it was right here at home. And when you talk to the folks, uh, you know, uh, up in New York that, that lived it, it was getting the country back. So then it was creating those it, movements. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of you will remember just a few days after, there were a couple of things. Uh, a few days after the attack uh, at the World Trade Center, President Bush actually went to New York City and, uh, and stood on the rubble pile, and that's where the famous video, if you've toured the museum, you see the, uh, the bullhorn that he actually gave that re those remarks from. Um, so it was that going to New York immediately after 9-11 and really sort of letting the American people know that we're going to move forward as a country and we're going to get through this. But even a bigger event, and I think we have a picture of it, was, uh, as many know, the, uh, the Yankees were in the World Series. And the MLB had debated whether they should call it off or whether they should delay. And, and give us, talk to us about that event because that was, I think this was one of the seminal events in President Bush's presidency that really unified the country. Yeah, it um, actually, the backstory uh, prior to, if you remember, the president was hosting a, uh, his, um, uh, a, a, a strategy meeting at Camp David uh, shortly after. And we were departing, going to Camp David, and I was, made, I was uh, accompanying the president on the trip. And um, as the president was, uh, Marine One was on the south grounds, and the press were uh, on the south grounds of the White House. And not sure why, but the president, uh, when he came out of the uh, Oval Office, instead of going directly to Marine One, he kind of singled me over. And I wasn't sure if he was you know, calling me over, or if there was someone behind me, and I didn't want to turn around because of all the press. Well, he had come over, and um, he said, guess what? We're going to the World Series, Yankee Stadium. And I went, what? <laughs> um, but that's how he was. He, he brought everyone, he just calmed the whole situation down. You know, it was a, it was a stressful period, and I was in shock. I mean, we're getting ready to go to Camp David, but he just calmed everyone down by, Nick, Nikki, we're going to Yankee Stadium, the World Series. And I, I, I forgot the Yankees were in the World Series. And we would tease each other as a big, big Yankee fan. But as we prepared to go, um, New York City, I mean, we had all forces uh, to assist, all the resources. And those that get a chance to watch the ESPN documentary will see, you know, just the behind the scenes, the, the stress and and the build up and everyone in the stadium, you know, had been gone through metal detectors. I think Billy Crystal was very clear that, uh, hey, if I got to get to the World Series, we have to go to metal detectors, we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, so it was a, um, it was a unique time. Uh, it, it, the planning was, um, you know, it was difficult because we're, it was a, it was an extremely stressful period. And you've got the World Series of Major League Baseball going on, but you have the President of the United States going, not to, to the stadium, but going to the field, to the mound, to throw out the first pitch. Uh, so it, it was the, the planning between New York City uh, support, uh, the other federal partners uh, made, uh, made the event um, uh, extremely Go forward. The, the planning to allow him to go out to the mound by him, if you saw the video, he went to the mound, all the way to, to the rubber on the mound to throw out the pitch without any security right around him. And all of that was possible because of the planning. Tell us a little bit about where agents were and... and... Yeah, so we had, um, uh, there's a, a, a photo and the baseball fans picked up right, right away on it because during the World Series and playoffs, you have the two extra umpires. Uh, well, there was a, an extra one. So, uh, <laughs> an again, extra, extra but, one. <laughs> but again, um, just as in the incident with Larry, um, and you had the agents in, in the assassination attempt of President Ford, as he said, they all left him. Well, that's what we're trained to do. So the agents are to respond and uh, to get the protect the out of the way. And here, 
Um, again, uh, unique situation. Um, it was a, uh, it was a, um, just a, uh, the planning that had gone in between uh, him going to the mound, uh, whether or not uh, he was actually going to, um, you know, stay for part of the game, stay for the game, where he would sit. So there was a lot that had, uh, had gone in. We had excellent support. The resources were, were tremendous. We had the umpires. We had such, the airspace, of course, was, was, um, was covered. Uh, we had pretty much everyone in uh, media assist us uh, tremendously also by giving access and baseball played a big part. The mound at Yankee Stadium was probably the safest place in the world. Safest place in the world. <laughs> That's right. Joe, can you talk to us? I'm going to segue. This is, I'm going to kind of meander all around with, with different topics. Um, tell us a little bit about how the Secret Service protects the children of the first family and, and sort of what goes into that and the delicacies of it and, and sort of how you, how you handle that. Because I know it's, it's, it's a difficult situation sometimes. It can be because the Secret Service, of course, wants to protect the children, but you also want to make sure they have as best as possible a normal uh, life, and that's very hard when you're in this bubble, and I realize that. Uh, my direct exposure to that was more with uh, Mrs. Obama, and I remember sitting down with Mrs. Obama. It was really the first time I sat down with her at length, and it was all about uh, Mrs. Obama wanted her kids to have a normal life, going to school plays, going to school, going to basketball games, and so on and so forth. And, um, and I wanted to make sure she knew that uh, we had the same goals. And, uh, and it's, as uh, kids get older, you know, in their teen, year, uh, teen years, it's more challenging because, as you can imagine, no teenager wants guys like me looking like <laughs> uh, coming out on a date, you know. Uh, <laughs> So that's always a balance, and you try to do, do the very best you can, but uh, you want to make sure they're in a safe environment. Great. Um, a huge part of any successful presidency is, requires foreign policy and foreign travel. Um, can you, and this is for the panel, um, maybe, Joe, you can start out with, with some thoughts on it, but traveling, taking the president overseas, he doesn't fly on a commercial plane and go up to Hertz and get a car and... <laughs> go off to his meetings. There's a tremendous amount of planning and it, it's staggering and you'd be shocked to know how many planes full of equipment and materials go overseas anytime the president travels. But can you talk to us a little bit about well, that? You're Jeff? exactly right, Spence. And, uh, you know, it's really moving the White House. You know, when the president travels overseas, you're moving the White House to that country. And, and with that, uh, the limousines, on these car planes that you see, the military aircraft, you can fit six to eight cars uh, on these aircraft. You can fit helicopters uh, on these uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, so everything moves in this foreign country. But one of the biggest, beyond the logistics, the challenge is the advance work because now you don't have the same authority that you would have within the states. So you're relying on those foreign uh, countries to do what you want. And there's a lot of negotiating back and forth and a lot of nudging back and forth and because uh, you, you want, you know what you want and what you need to have a safe environment, but we don't always get to that, uh, to that point. And so reciprocity is a big part of it when you're on uh, negotiating for whether you can ha carry your weapons in a foreign country or not, or, or whether we can fly Marine One, and uh, China always would fight us on, right. on whether we could fly Marine One. And so talk to that a little bit about how you negotiate, and then hopefully when their leader comes to the States, you know, it's an even exchange. Well, Dick? You're good. Yeah, so the... the because we have a good video we're going to show you in a minute of how there was some negotiation, and then there wasn't an even exchange. The advance teams would go out, you know, roughly 15 and sometimes even 20 days, depending on the nature of the visit and the type of summit. But, um, you know, again, a lot of these leaders are also coming here to the United States. But, you know, we hold a pretty firm requirement. We're not going to allow the president and the first lady uh, to be unescorted. Uh, we're just not, you know, and we, the advance teams really have to push on it. And sometimes we've got to get the political folks. We have to get the ambassadors. We have to get the chiefs of staff. We have to get the director of the uh, White House advance team um, to negotiate, you know, our requirements. Because when you get into a summit, and you're going to see the video later, but when you get into a summit, there's 30 counterparts or 20 counterparts of security. So what do you do with all of these security folks? But, you know, as Joe was saying, 
uh, it's the cars, it's food, it's, um, it's medical supplies, and it, it's the whole White House is actually moving regardless of the length of time uh, that the president is traveling. So there's an entire um, uh, uh, re uh, uh, package that goes along with this, let alone the cars. And then you have all the spares, right? You, you know, and you look at the aircrafts, and, and as Joe said, Marine One. Uh, so you've got to have these backup plans, and you've got to have all the medical. So it is a, it is a big footprint, but um, it's, it's all about... It's not just about evacuating the president and the first lady in a threat. It's also allowing the president to fulfill the president's duties to run the country, to govern the United States. And wherever the president is, that machine follows. And we're part of that, along with the military, the medical unit, so that the president can fulfill his duties as the chief executor. He can, the president can literally do anything in a foreign country that he could do at the White House. Every piece of technology, uh, equipment, and personnel and resources he has when he's on a foreign trip. Um, let's run the video, because we have an interesting video of a foreign trip to Chile. You want to narrate this, Nick? We had just, uh, uh, this was an Asia Pacific summit, so there's 30 uh, countries. It's the countries that touch the uh, Pacific uh, Ocean. And uh, the President and First Lady had just arrived, but prior to that, uh, they took, the Chileans had taken uh, the Secret Service advance agent away from the site. And uh, so we had a, a slight delay. But at this point, I thought it was uh, okay to go, so we left. Uh, the President and First Lady, we talked about it um, as we went. What happened was, I stayed back a little bit to allow the press to take the photograph of the President, the First Lady, along with the President of Chile and the First Lady of Chile. And then the security started closing in, as you could see behind the president. And he now hears me yelling. Uh, <laughs> so he was trained well. <laughs> so it was for I was fortunate because um, I. <laughs> So it was like Moses parting the water. Um, <coughs> and the first lady's here, so she can uh, attest to, they had heard, I, they, they were hitting me. And I'm not sure why, but uh, in, in all seriousness, I actually thought for that moment, because this is like a game, right? It's like uh, the security part is like a, um, you know, it's a, it's a dangerous game. And, and we're maintaining the prize. We have the president. And at that moment, I actually thought today was the day because I was the only foreign security allowed inside. And I thought that today was the day that they were hitting me and no one's ever done that before. They were grabbing my arms and I was yelling, you know, get your hands off of me. What are you doing it for? And they're, I'm right-handed, so my weapon is on my right side and that's where they were hitting me. So it was really confusing. And then the doors were closing, which was uh, definitely, uh, um, you know, a concern. And then, so as I got pushed my way up to the stairs, the president and the first lady heard the commotion, heard the yelling. My Chilean counterpart actually tried to help, but the others uh, weren't binding, and they formed this wall. And then the president, as I said, like Moses, came and kind of parted the waters, um, and I came in. But again, as Spence said, the advance team, not only the Secret Service, but the White House advance team worked it out to ensure that the Secret Service was going to have the representative in with the president and accompany the president and first lady at all times. And then something broke down. Uh, and it broke down just 10 minutes prior to departure. Um, and then we were able to get the agent back. But then, Spence, if you remember, they took the White House staff uh, representative along with the uh, uh, Secret Service uh, agent and took them away and actually put them in a room. And they secured it with an officer. And now we had no one. And then they finally, when we decided that we were not going, we were waiting, that's when they brought the uh, individual back. So even though last minute, things change. You have these agreements, and then last minute, things change. Yeah, I remember uh, a trip, uh, the president's last trip to China uh, was for the Olympics. And we, I had made two or three trips to China prior to negotiate with, right. with a pre-advanced team, a survey team, to negotiate for credentials and 
passes and permits and vehicle placards and and we were on Air Force One flying to Beijing and that still hadn't been worked out. So it, sometimes it just... Yeah, one thing to add to that, and it's not that the United States, I mean, there was all this negative press after, but the, the United States, it, it's not that, you know, we're, you know, we're tops and, you know, we want to, you know, be, be the rulers. We're, we recognize, and so do my, our counterparts from the foreign countries, that the United States president, whoever the president is, brings in the highest threat. The highest threat is against the U.S. president. And they recognize that. However, at these summits, whether it's the G8, the G20, or in this case, the Asia Pacific, where there's 30 heads of state, there's 30 detail leaders. And, uh, but again, the United States, with, again, with support of the White House, of course, um, ensure and hold that where the president or first lady are never unescorted. Uh, and we do then when they come here to the United States, the Secret Service does, um, does play a good partner with them. But they also don't bring that footprint. And Spence, you know you've worked many of these. The foreign governments don't come uh, with that big machine. Right, and we are, often, we, I mean, we, it, when I mentioned reciprocity earlier, we try and give them Absolutely. everything that we've Absolutely. asked for in their country, we, Absolutely. we, uh, we give them when they, when they come on their trips. Let's, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Let's make one comment. Uh, you saw President Bush's support there coming back for Nick there, but also uh, I'll just say there was another uh, uh, event where there was a state dinner planned, and we noticed when we were doing the advance that magnetometers were not in place at this White House uh, in the foreign country, and nobody was checking for weapons, and we had, I, Nick was my supervisor at the time, my boss, and I called back and said, Nick, I don't think it's, uh, my, my recommendation is we don't go, uh, because we can't vouch for 250 people unmagged. And uh, eventually we went to the deputy chief of staff at the time, and, uh, and the end result was they scrapped the uh, state dinner, which of course we never want to be in that position because there's a lot of political uh, ramifications here, but again, it showed the support that uh, President Bush had uh, for the security here. And eventually they had a 14 on each side uh, dinner, um, including the director of the Secret Service at the time. But uh, that support was very important. Let's talk, let's move to post-presidency. Larry, you ran President Ford's detail. You were the sack of his detail in post-presidency. Talk to us a little bit about that and the challenges of, of a post-presidency uh, without all the support that, that, the, that the president had when he was in office? You know, people don't understand the, how difficult it is for, to cover a former president. Like I had former President Ford and Mrs. Ford, seven months in Vail. <laughs> no. Five, <laughs> right. five months in Vail and seven months in Palm Springs. Every year, over and over. It was very, very, very stressful. <laughs> The, uh, the, uh, much different with a former president, of course, you want to make sure you have your, you no longer have a military plane, Air Force One, so you got to make sure you have your American Airlines mileage card because <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of time. And traveling with a former president uh, and Mrs. Ford, it, it's a little different because uh, you are on a public plane. Uh, they, they want to greet them. President Ford had a great uh, system. He would get on the plane and flying in first class, that, that made me, I had to fly first then too. So, <laughs> but he would go on the inside uh, seat, I'd be on the aisle, he'd immediately go to sleep, so to speak. And people would come by and go, you know. <laughs> and they would, they, would, they would go by. But he was, uh, both he and Mrs. Ford were just uh, spectacular to work for um, and you know, he was great on the golf course. Bob Hope made jokes about him. He, Bob Hope told, said that he was the only president that could play two golf courses simultaneously. <laughs> so, and, and the jokes kept going on and on. But uh, a very gracious couple, and it was a privilege to be uh, on their detail. Great. Um, Nick, let's, you and I had the privilege to do a, a couple of secret trips. This is... Um, Joe, you were on them as well. T talk to us a little bit about uh, what it takes to plan a secret trip by a sitting president to a foreign country without anybody knowing. Well, finding out on the first one, um, 
there was a lot of drama, of course, and uh, gotten called in. There was only a few of us that were told of it. And uh, we had gone to a room to get the briefing. And I actually remember, um, you, you know, the, it was, it, it, it's in all the history books in, in one of the rooms below ground. And it's a long table. And I remember at the end of the table, there was only about five of us in the room, Mr. Hagen. Um, and um, I remember a tray of chocolate chip cookies at the end that weren't for us. And I remember Mr. Hagen <laughs> coming in and saying, what, what I'm about to tell you is uh, coming from the president, and it's not negotiable. The president's going to go to Baghdad. And I'm not sure why, but I just kind of shot up and went, what, what, no? And I went right for those cookies. <laughs> uh, I actually unraveled and started eating them. And I looked at the director, and I realized I was an adult and supposed to have some responsibility. So I went back. But then from that moment forward, we had five days to plan for this trip. And it, it wasn't just taking a sitting president into a war zone. It was secretly doing it. The White House or any place, uh, the ranch in this case, where we, where we left from, um, it's not set up to sneak the president out, especially when we did the second ones uh, at the White House. Um, and Mrs. Bush will recall uh, on the second one when uh, the president um, I went up early in the morning, and he had his uh, sunglasses and, um, and ball cap on, and Maria said he was in the hallway. And I took a peek, and Barney was there and Miss Beasley, and I said, sir, we're ready. And, um, and I said, the glasses? And he said, shh. And I went, <laughs> and he said, you said we're sneaking out. I don't want Barney to know. <laughs> And I wanted to say, just get in the elevator. But he actually said in the elevator, he said, Nick, you know, like, you know, chill. And I went, so I don't know if I could do any more of these, because this was the second one. So the planning was, you know, when you're secretly doing it, you, 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 there were Secret Service people we couldn't share information with, let alone folks on the detail. And it, was a, uh, it wasn't a want to know, it was a need to know. We had to safely, successfully, take the president out so that the president could fulfill his mission. Did I want him to go there? Of course not. But that's not what we're all about. And the president was adamant when we went there. And Spence, as you know, was we agreed to three hours on the ground, which we got about three and a half from four. But the president was clear that he was going to serve every Thanksgiving meal to every soldier. Uh, and it was a moving moment. And then he met with some of the um, uh, leaders uh, in the community. And uh, that was the, the photo you're seeing now was the- That's in the chow uh, hall. In the chow yeah. hall. But, uh, but you're, you're also not telling the military. And Air Force One, uh, Colonel Tillman did an outstanding job of taking this aircraft, uh, you know, changed the codes as, as, as he's talked about, uh, flew uh, without the call signs, and, and then arriving in country, not only were the men and women in awe when they saw the president, but uh, the other folks on the ground had no clue. So it was a, a, a team effort, but only five days. Yeah, five days, and literally 99.9% .9 of the White House staff did not know. Most of the Secret Service agents that weren't on the detail are going to be involved in it did not know. Right. Members of the president's family probably did not know. So they were uh, sneaking the president out of the White House. As any of you have been to Washington, you know all around the White House, tourists are everywhere. You can't just drive him out. He, he, and so there was a lot that went into to getting him out of there, getting him to Andrews, aboard the plane, and, and then having the plane take off, and then fly all the way to Iraq without another airliner passing it in the sky and saying, oh, there goes Air Force One. <laughs> and, and that's happened. That, that yeah, happened, that, right. And the first one, if you remember, we had left uh, um, uh, Crawford, and we had a switch in, in the hangar at Andrews because they had to leave with a full tank yeah. you know, of gas, and then we went, uh, we flew direct. Joe, do you have some well, again, my During Nick's time as the uh, SAC, I was uh, with the White House branch, so I was just involved in helping him get out of the, uh, out of the White House complex. But uh, then years later, President Obama uh, went over on one of those missions, and fortunately, I had the experience from watching Nick and how uh, his team worked it. And uh, the one rule was that if it leaked out, uh, we would not do all the stops. We would limit the time on the ground. And as we were leaving Turkey to go to Iraq, uh, it did leak out. Uh, so once again, you're in a position where you have to make a recommendation, which you know is not popular, 
but, uh, and the recommendation was we just go to the military base and uh, there were a lot of discussions about it, but once again, uh, at that point, the Obama administration, uh, there was a big discussion on Air Force One and, and they were very supportive and, uh, and it, it means a lot to the agents, of course, when uh, you get that kind of support. And, Spence, and, can I yeah. embarrass him for a second? Go ahead. Uh, on that trip, what uh, Joe didn't uh, mention, uh, Joe was a special agent in charge with President Obama. I was the assistant director, and we were leaving, as he said, from Istanbul to go to uh, Afghanistan. It, it was a secret trip, and uh, they were planning the trip. And, um, but prior to departing uh, the last venue in Istanbul, uh, as Joe said, the word it was getting out, and um, the staff were still working on the time of the trip, how much time on the ground, and the staff again, because of their uh, priorities and their mission, were extending it. And Joe was holding firm. Uh, he wouldn't say this, so I'm gonna embarrass him. Um, but it's an important point because it shows the relationship, regardless of what you read in these newspapers, the relationship of the president and the first lady with the detail is tremendous uh, because they recognize and they support. In this particular case, and I was present for it, uh, the president uh, had his senior advisors and was asking for the plan. What is the schedule? And they were given this long, long, we're gonna do this and extend and extend. He looked at the, uh, Joe, President Obama looked at Joe, saw obviously he wasn't buying into the extended program and said, Joe, what schedule do you prefer? And he said the shorter one. And the president said, that's it, and walked out and said, and we went to the cars. And the decision was made, uh, regardless of the senior staff, uh, he relied, uh, relied on Joe. Yep. Um, let's talk. Yes, thanks. thanks Nick. Uh, here at the Bush Center, uh, there's a new special exhibit away from the White House. Um, let's talk about where our presidents go when they're not uh, staying in the White House. So let's cover their private residences where they go and maybe a little bit about Camp David. Any. Let's start with Larry. Good Larry. Skiing. Well, we went to bail. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the hard part about that was when he was in office, was the uh, <laughs> was the advance team, as you said, you know, sometimes two, three weeks out ahead. I, so I was a skier, I still am, I think. But uh, so the advance team would have to go out for two weeks ahead of the president to veil for mountain familiarization. <laughs> this required us getting up with the ski patrol at the crack of dawn to ski fresh powder <laughs> and familiarize ourselves with all the runs to make sure that, that there was no one hiding in the trees, et cetera. <laughs> but it was a pretty interesting operation that we moved about the mountain uh, in such a way, there we are, great outfit, Larry. But uh, the, uh, we'd move about the mountain without people being able to really trail us, the way we ran our formations. And we would go into a ski line, obviously, to the ski instructor line. We'd go through the line. We'd be up the mountain, down a run, and gone. So we were able to move about without interrupting the normal ski days of everyone else. So it worked out pretty well. Great. And Nick, t talk yeah. a little bit about the rain. Yeah, go ahead. Well, well with that, uh, what's important is Again, the first families are trying to live a normal life in this, you know, in this bubble. And you know, as Larry said about skiing, the Secret Service has to take this private nature uh, when they go into this public nature. President Reagan, horseback rider. President Bush, 41. Uh, you know, what did he not do, right? Uh, boats, uh, water. Um, President Bush, running biking, and uh, President Clinton, President uh, uh, Bush, President Obama, all the other you know, activities. So the Secret Service had to train uh, agents on horseback, and U.S. Park Police played a, a tremendous role because it's about how to ex extract or evacuate the president and the first lady while they're on horseback. Uh, how about getting to them in water safety, in, in boat patrol, President Bush, uh, George H. Bush, 41, I remember being up at Kenny Bunkport uh, and the press would be all around there and he'd say, how many fish did you catch? 
and he'd say, fish with all these boats between media <laughs> boats and secret service, it scared all the fish away. <laughs> and for those of you who may have read, read books about uh, President Bush 41, he, uh, he, that boat Fidelity was not a slow boat. He would drive uh, that thing at full throttle. Full throttle. Yeah. So, so talk to us a little bit about the training because we're sort of making light of it, but it is serious. They have to learn to mountain bike. President Bush mountain bikes on his ranch in Crawford and uh, he's a serious mountain biker and you have to be able to keep up with him. Before the mountain bike was the running because during the campaign he averaged, and, and I hope he's not listening, but he averaged around, uh, which was a tremendous 740 pace and I wasn't a runner. Uh, in fact, I didn't like to run. Um, but he ran a race in D.C. as president, ran the three-mile race, it's made the cover of Runner's World, uh, ran a 640 pace for three miles. Um, but at the ranch and wherever else place he ran, I mean, he was averaging about a 710 pace. So just the training of that alone, the agents with equipment, the radio, a weapon, um, no vest, and then the President Bush started these heat runs. I didn't know what a heat run was, and neither did he when he created it, but he formed his 100 degree club. That which later went to uh, his mountain bike. And uh, so it's, it's <laughs> you could start out thinking that, well, you're in pretty good shape. It's finishing the race with the president, and do you have enough energy to hopefully um, and successfully uh, evacuate or, or attend to the medical? So you're definitely in training all the time. Uh, but it was a, you had to look at formations. You had to look at, with, with 41, uh, as, as everyone knows, with Kenny Bunkport, you know, their home was surrounded by three sides of water. So the U.S. Coast Guard, we had a great partnership with the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard uh, assisted. But the, the Secret Service agents had to prepare water, in water safety, boat handling, boat safety, on how to uh, extract the president from the water. But it's not just helo lift from the water. It was putting him maybe in a boat and then bringing him to shore. So we had to get armored vehicles aligned. We had these imaginary lines, uh, the smart ones, not me, but the smart ones figured out how to divide up the Atlantic Ocean. And, and if the president, and, and we have Mark Lowry, who was, the, uh, uh, was on the detail with us and former agent in charge here in Dallas. Uh, you recall Kenny Bunkport, we would have to um, you know, move the cars and get ready to uh, receive the president if he had to come on shore. So the president would cross over this imaginary line and uh, you were with the first lady, uh, you spent the time with Tranquility with, the, with Barbara Bush and we would move, they would say the uh, president's in this zone and we'd move the cars. We'd wait 10 minutes uh, and then we'd start moving cars around again. And it was, you know, it was, there was training involved in it, but we were moving and, and you're kind of disrupting the town also. But all of that comes down to, Spence, as you said earlier as we started, and Joe talked about training. It all comes down to training. And the success of training was a successful attempt uh, that Larry uh, prevented. Yeah. His training. Let, let's talk about that in, in closing. We just have a, a minute or two left. Um, let's talk about how you're trained to make a split-second decision. Uh, Oftentimes, you know, it's just, it's, it, you, don't, you have zero, you just have to react. And how, how, do, how are you trained to do that? Well. Go ahead, Joe. Why don't no, you no, start? No, no, yeah. no, you go ahead because you got the training part of it. I'm just going to say oh. that it is what it is, you know, the training that you have to do. And then it comes down to the person of can you react when the time comes in the right way. Yeah. And I, I think of uh, Jerry Parr would often talk about uh, his experience on, in 1981 during the Reagan assassination attempt, and, and most of you have seen the video of that. And you look at um, Tim McCarthy, when the first shot rang out, Tim turned around and made himself big. Uh, that's not a natural instinct when you hear a gunshot to make yourself big. It's usually to cover yourself, get behind cover, concealment. But he made himself big to protect the president. And that's from repetitive training uh, that our training staff would do so well. And sometimes, this sort of is our wrap up, sometimes with all the greatest security, the most trained personnel, the best equipment, sometimes the, pre sometimes the president just has to take matters into his own hands. And in Baghdad, he had, to, he had to fulfill the old Texas two-shoe, two-step two right here. He was pretty quick. 
Well, this concludes our presentation. <laughs> This concludes our panel. Mrs. Bush, thank you very much for having us. We really enjoyed being here. And, yeah, Joe, uh, Spencer, if you don't mind, I, we all felt very honored to be invited down here today, and we've had some fun up here telling some stories and all, but uh, uh, we certainly thank the Bush family, the extended Bush family, for all they've done for the Secret Service over years. But um, when you go, to, and we told some stories here tonight, but when you uh, go to the Bush Library and see the enormity of what they've done uh, for this country, uh, it just makes you very proud. So, uh, Mrs. Bush, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Spence, Joe, Nick, and Larry for a fantastic uh, program. I told you it would be both informative and entertaining, and they delivered as we knew they would. Thank you all for coming. Uh, tonight you'll be exiting through the museum. Uh, please take a few minutes, if you can, to stop by and visit our, our new special exhibit, Presidential Retreats, away from the White House, which will be open until 8.15. Uh, and remember, tickets are available at bushcenter.org for our next Engage program, our annual Highland Capital Lecture on June 12th, Dana Perino, with a conversation about global flashpoints with Ian Bremmer and Neil Ferguson. Thank you, and have a good evening.